Moby Dick, Chapters seventy four to seventy seven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wells. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters seventy four to seventy seven. Chapter seventy four. The sperm whale's head. Contrasted view. Here now are two great whales laying their heads together. Let us join them and lay together our own. Of the grand order of folio leviathans, the sperm whale and the right whale are by far the most noteworthy. They are the only whales regularly hunted by man. To the Nantucketer they present the two extremes of all the known varieties of the whale. As the external difference between them is mainly observable in their heads, and as a head of each is this moment hanging from the Pequod's side, and as we may freely go from one to the other by merely stepping across the deck, where, I should like to know, will you obtain a better chance to study practical cetology than here? In the first place, you are struck by the general contrast between these heads. Both are massive enough in all conscience, but there is a certain mathematical symmetry in the sperm whales which the right whales sadly lacks. There is more character in the sperm whale's head. As you behold it, you involuntarily yield the immense superiority to him in point of pervading dignity. In the present instance, too, this dignity is heightened by the pepper-and-salt color of his head at the summit, giving token of advanced age and large experience. In short, he is what the fishermen technically call a gray-headed whale. Let us now note what is least dissimilar in these heads, namely the two most important organs, the eye and the ear. Far back on the side of the head, and low down, near the angle of either whale's jaw, if you narrowly search, you will at last see a lashless eye, which you would fancy to be a young colt's eye, so out of all proportion is it to the magnitude of the head. Now from this peculiar sideway position of the whale's eyes, it is plain that he can never see an object which is exactly ahead, no more than he can one exactly astern. In a word, the position of the whale's eyes corresponds to that of a man's ears, and you may fancy for yourself how it would fare with you did you sideways survey objects through your ears. You would find that you could only command some thirty degrees of vision in advance of the straight sideline of sight, and about thirty more behind it. If your bitterest foe were walking straight towards you, with dagger uplifted in broad day, you would not be able to see him, any more than if he were stealing upon you from behind. In a word, you would have two backs, so to speak, but at the same time also two fronts, side fronts. For what is it that makes the front of a man, what indeed, but his eyes? Moreover, while in most other animals that I can now think of, the eyes are so planted as imperceptibly to blend their visual power, so as to produce one picture and not two to the brain, the peculiar position of the whale's eyes, effectually divided as they are by many cubic feet of solid head, which towers between them like a great mountain separating two lakes and valleys, this, of course, must wholly separate the impressions which each independent organ imparts. The whale, therefore, must see one distinct picture on this side, and another distinct picture on that side, while all between must be profound darkness and nothingness to him. Man may, in effect, be said to look out on the world from a sentry-box with two joined sashes for his window, but for the whale... These two sashes are separately inserted, making two distinct windows, but sadly impairing the view. This peculiarity of the whale's eyes is a thing always to be borne in mind in the fishery, and to be remembered by the reader in some subsequent scenes. A curious and most puzzling question might be started concerning this visual matter as touching the leviathan. But I must be content with a hint. 
So long as a man's eyes are open in the light, the act of seeing is involuntary, that is, he cannot help mechanically seeing whatever objects are before him. Nevertheless, anyone's experience will teach him that though he can take in an undiscriminating sweep of things at one glance, it is quite impossible for him, attentively and completely, to examine any two things, however large or however small, at one and the same instant of time, never mind if they lie side by side and touch each other. But if you now come to separate these two objects, and surround each by a circle of profound darkness, then in order to see one of them, in such a manner as to bring your mind to bear on it, the other will be utterly excluded from your contemporary consciousness. How is it then with the whale? True, both his eyes in themselves must simultaneously act, but is his brain so much more comprehensive, combining, and subtle than man's, that he can, at the same moment of time, attentively examine two distinct prospects, one on one side of him, and the other in an exactly opposite direction? If he can, then is it a marvellous thing in him, as if a man were able to simultaneously go through the demonstrations of two distinct problems in Euclid, nor, strictly investigated, is there any incongruity in this comparison. It may be but an idle whim, but it has always seemed to me that the extraordinary vacillations of movement displayed by some whales when beset by three or four boats, the timidity and liability to queer frights so common to such whales, I think that all this indirectly proceeds from the helpless perplexity of volition in which their divided and diametrically opposite powers of vision must involve them. But the ear of the whale is full as curious as the eye. If you are an entire stranger to their race, you might hunt over these two heads for hours and never discover that organ. The ear has no external leaf whatever, and into the hole itself you can hardly insert a quill, so wondrously minute is it. It is lodged a little behind the eye. With respect to their ears, this important difference is to be observed between the sperm whale and the right, while the ear of the former has an external opening, that of the latter is entirely and evenly covered over with a membrane, so as to be quite imperceptible from without. Is it not curious that so vast a being as the whale should see the world through so small an eye, and hear the thunder through an ear which is smaller than a hare's? But if the eye were broad as the lens of Herschel's great telescope, and his ears capacious as the porches of cathedrals, would that make him any longer of sight or sharper of hearing? Not at all. Why, then, do you try to enlarge your mind? Subtilize it. Let us now, with whatever levers and steam engines we have at hand, cant over the sperm whale's head, that it may lie bottom up, then, ascending by a ladder to the summit, have a peep down the mouth, and were it not that the body is now completely separated from it, with a lantern we might descend into the great Kentucky mammoth cave of the stomach. But let us hold on here by this tooth, and look about us where we are. What a really beautiful and chaste-looking mouth, from floor to ceiling, lined, or rather papered, with a glistening white membrane, glossy as bridal satins. But come out now, and look at this portentous lower jaw, which seems like the long, narrow lid of an immense snuff-box, with the hinge at one end, instead of one side. If you pry it up, so as to get it overhead, and expose its rows of teeth, it seems a terrific portcullis, and such, alas, it proves to many a poor wight in the fishery, upon whom these spikes fall with impaling force. But far more terrible is it to behold, when fathoms down in the sea, you see some sulky whale floating there suspended with his prodigious jaw some fifteen feet long, hanging straight down at right angles with his body, for all the world like a ship's jib-boom. This whale is not dead, he is only dispirited, out of sorts perhaps, hypochondriac and so supine that the hinges of his jaw have relaxed, leaving him there in that ungainly sort of plight, 
a reproach to all his tribe, who must, no doubt, imprecate lockjaws upon him. In most cases this lower jaw, being easily unhinged by a practised artist, is disengaged and hoisted on deck for the purpose of extracting the ivory teeth, and furnishing a supply of that hard white whalebone with which the fishermen fashion all sorts of curious articles, including canes, umbrella stocks, and handles to riding whips. With a long, weary hoist the jaw is dragged on board, as if it were an anchor, and when the proper time comes, some few days after the other work, Queequeg, Dagoo, and Tashtego, all being accomplished dentists, are set to drawing teeth. With a keen cutting spade, Queequeg lances the gums, then the jaw is lashed down to ring bolts, and a tackle being rigged from aloft, they drag out these teeth, as Michigan oxen drag stumps of old oaks out of wild woodlands. There are generally forty-two teeth in all, in old whales much worn down, but undecayed, nor filled after our artificial fashion. The jaw is afterwards sawn into slabs, and piled away like joists for building houses. Chapter 75 The Right Whale's Head Contrasted View Crossing the deck, let us now have a good long look at the right whale's head. As in general shape the noble sperm whale's head may be compared to a Roman war chariot, especially in front where it is so broadly rounded, so at a broad view the right whale's head bears a rather inelegant resemblance to a gigantic galliot-toed shoe. Two hundred years ago an old Dutch voyager likened its shape to that of a shoemaker's last, and in this same last or shoe that old woman of the nursery tale with her swarming brood might very comfortably be lodged, she and all her progeny. But as you come nearer to this great head, it begins to assume different aspects, according to your point of view. If you stand on its summit and look at these two F-shaped spout-holes, you would take the whole head for an enormous base vial, and these spiracles the apertures in its sounding-board. Then again, if you fix your eyes upon this strange, crested, comb-like incrustation on the top of the mass, this green barnacled thing which the Greenlanders call the crown, and the southern fishers the bonnet of the right whale, fixing your eyes solely on this, you would take the head for a trunk of some huge oak, with a bird's nest in its crotch. At any rate, when you watch those live crabs that nestle here on this bonnet, such an idea will be almost sure to occur to you, unless indeed your fancy has been fixed by the technical term crown also bestowed upon it, in which case you will take great interest in thinking how this mighty monster is actually a diademed king of the sea, whose green crown has been put together for him in this marvellous manner. But if this whale be a king, he is a very sulky-looking fellow to grace a diadem. Look at that hanging lower lip. What a huge sulk and pout is there. A sulk and pout by carpenter's measurement, about twenty feet long and five feet deep. A sulk and pout that will yield you some five hundred gallons of oil and more. A great pity now that this unfortunate whale should be hair-lipped. The fissure is about a foot across. Probably the mother, during an important interval, was sailing down the Peruvian coast when earthquakes caused the beach to gape. Over this lip, as over a slippery threshold, we now slide into the mouth. Upon my word, were I at Mackinaw, I should take this to be the inside of an Indian wigwam. Good Lord! Is this the road that Jonah went? The roof is about twelve feet high, and runs to a pretty sharp angle, as if there were a regular ridge-pole there, while these ribbed, arched, hairy sides present us with those wondrous, half-vertical, scimitar-shaped slats of whalebone, say three hundred on a side, which, depending from the upper part of the head or crown-bone, form those Venetian blinds which have elsewhere been cursorily mentioned. The edges of these bones are fringed with hairy fibres, through which the right whale strains the water, 
and in whose intricacies he retains the small fish when open-mouthed he goes through the seas of Brit in feeding time. In the central blinds of bone, as they stand in their natural order, there are certain curious marks, curves, hollows, and ridges, whereby some whalemen calculate the creature's age, as the age of an oak by its circular rings. Though the certainty of this criterion is far from demonstrable, yet it has the savour of analogical probability. At any rate, if we yield to it, we must grant a far greater age to the right whale than at first glance will seem reasonable. In old times there seem to have prevailed the most curious fancies concerning these blinds. One voyager in purchase calls them the wondrous whiskers inside of the whale's mouth, another hog's bristles, a third old gentleman in Hackluit uses the following elegant language, quote, there are about two hundred and fifty fins growing on each side of his upper chop, which arch over his tongue on each side of his mouth. End quote. Footnote. This reminds us that the right whale really has a sort of whisker, or rather a mustache, consisting of a few scattered white hairs on the upper part of the outer end of the lower jaw, Sometimes these tufts impart a rather brigandish expression to his otherwise solemn countenance. End of footnote. As every one knows, these same hog's bristles, fins, whiskers, blinds, or whatever you please, furnish to the ladies their busks and other stiffening contrivances. But in this particular the demand has long been on the decline. It was in Queen Anne's time that the bone was in its glory, the farthingale being then all the fashion. And as those ancient dams moved about gaily, though in the jaws of the whale, as you may say, even so in a shower, with like thoughtlessness, do we nowadays fly under the same jaws for protection, the umbrella being a tent spread over the same bone. But now forget all about blinds and whiskers for a moment, and standing in the right whale's mouth, look around you afresh. Seeing all these colonnades of bone so methodically ranged about, would you not think you were inside of the great Harlem organ, and gazing upon its thousand pipes? For a carpet to the organ we have a rug of the softest turkey, the tongue, which is glued, as it were, to the floor of the mouth, it is very fat and tender, and apt to tear in pieces in hoisting it on deck. This particular tongue now before us, at a passing glance I should say it was a six-barreler, that is, it will yield you about that amount of oil. Ere this you must have plainly seen the truth of what I started with, that the sperm whale and the right whale have almost entirely different heads. To sum up, then, in the right whales there is no great well of sperm, no ivory teeth at all, no long slender mandible of a lower jaw like the sperm whales. Nor in the sperm whale are there any of those blinds of bone, no huge lower lip, and scarcely anything of a tongue. Again, the right whale has two external spout holes, the sperm whale only one. Look your last now on these venerable hooded heads, while they yet lie together, for one will soon sink unrecorded in the sea, and the other will not be very long in following. Can you catch the expression of the sperm whales there? It is the same he died with, only some of the longer wrinkles in the forehead now seem faded away. I think his broad brow to be full of a prairie-like placidity, born of a speculative indifference as to death, but mark the other head's expression. See that amazing lower lip, pressed by accident against the vessel's side, so as firmly to embrace the jaw. Does not this whole head seem to speak of an enormous practical resolution in facing death? This right whale I take to have been a stoic. The sperm whale, a Platonian, who might have taken up Spinoza in his latter years. CHAPTER 76. THE BATTERING RAM Ere quitting for the nonce the sperm whale's head, I would have you, as a sensible physiologist simply, 
particularly remark its front aspect in all its compacted collectedness. I would have you investigate it now with the sole view of forming to yourself some unexaggerated, intelligent estimate of whatever battering ram power may be lodged there. Here is a vital point, for you must either satisfactorily settle this matter with yourself, or forever remain an infidel as to one of the most appalling, but not the less true events, perhaps anywhere to be found in all recorded history. You observe that in the ordinary swimming position of the sperm whale, the front of his head presents an almost wholly vertical plane to the water. You observe that the lower part of that front slopes considerably backwards, so as to furnish more of a retreat for the long socket which receives the boom-like lower jaw. You observe that the mouth is entirely under the head, much in the same way indeed as though your own mouth were entirely under your chin. Moreover, you observe that the whale has no external nose, and that what nose he has, his spout-hole, is on the top of his head. You observe that his eyes and ears are at the sides of his head, nearly one-third of his entire length from the front. Wherefore, you must now have perceived that the front of the sperm whale's head is a dead blind wall, without a single organ or tender prominence of any sort whatsoever. Furthermore, you are now to consider that only in the extreme lower backward-sloping part of the front of the head is there the slightest vestige of bone. And not till you get near twenty feet from the forehead do you come to the full cranial development. So that this whole enormous boneless mass is as one wad, Finally, though, as will soon be revealed, its contents partly comprise the most delicate oil, yet you are now to be apprised of the nature of the substance which so impregnably invests all that apparent effeminacy. In some previous place I have described to you how the blubber wraps the body of the whale, as the rind wraps an orange, just so with the head, but with this difference, about the head this envelope, though not so thick, is of a boneless toughness, inestimable by any man who has not handled it. The severest pointed harpoon, the sharpest lance darted by the strongest human arm, impotently rebounds from it. It is as though the forehead of the sperm whale were paved with horse's hoofs. I do not think that any sensation lurks in it. Bethink yourself also of another thing. When two large, loaded Indiamen chance to crowd and crush towards each other in the docks, what do the sailors do? They do not suspend between them, at the point of coming contact, any merely hard substance like iron or wood. No, they hold there a large round wad of tow and cork, enveloped in the thickest and toughest of ox-hide. That, bravely and uninjured, takes the jam which would have snapped all their oaken handspikes and iron crowbars. By itself this sufficiently illustrates the obvious fact I drive at. But supplementary to this, it has hypothetically occurred to me that as ordinary fish possess what is called a swimming bladder in them, capable at will of distension or contraction, and as the sperm whale, as far as I know, has no such provision in him, Considering, too, the otherwise inexplicable manner in which he now depresses his head altogether beneath the surface, and anon swims with it high elevated out of the water, considering the unobstructed elasticity of its envelope, considering the unique interior of his head, it has hypothetically occurred to me, I say, that those mystical lung-celled honeycombs there may possibly have some hitherto unknown and unsuspected connection with the outer air, so as to be susceptible to atmospheric distension and contraction. If this be so, fancy the irresistibleness of that might to which the most impalpable and destructive of all elements contributes. Now, Mark, unerringly impelling this dead, impregnable, uninjurable wall, and this most buoyant thing within, there swims behind it all a mass of tremendous life, only to be adequately estimated as piled wood is, by the cord, and all obedient to one volition as the smallest insect. 
so that when I shall hereafter detail to you all the specialties and concentrations of potency everywhere lurking in this expansive monster, when I shall show you some of his more inconsiderable braining feats, I trust you will have renounced all ignorant incredulity, and be ready to abide by this, that though the sperm-whale stove a passage through the isthmus of Darien, and mixed the Atlantic with the Pacific, you would not elevate one hair of your eyebrow. For unless you own the whale, you are but a provincial and sentimentalist in truth. But clear truth is a thing for salamander giants only to encounter. How small the chances for the provincials, then! What befell the weakling youth lifting the dread goddess's veil at Lais? Chapter 77 the Great Heidelberg Tun. Now comes the bailing of the case, but to comprehend it aright, you must know something of the curious internal structure of the thing operated upon. Regarding the sperm whale's head as a solid oblong, you may, on an inclined plane, sideways divide it into two coins, whereof the lower is the bony structure forming the cranium and jaws, and the upper an unctuous mass wholly free from bones, its broad forward end forming the expanded vertical apparent forehead of the whale. At the middle of the forehead, horizontally subdivide this upper coin, and then you have two almost equal parts, which before were naturally divided by an internal wall of a thick tendinous substance. Footnote. Coin is not a Euclidean term, it belongs to the pure nautical mathematics. I know not that it has been defined before. A coin is a solid which differs from a wedge in having its sharp end formed by the steep inclination of one side instead of the mutual tapering of both sides. End of footnote. The lower subdivided part, called the junk, is one immense honeycomb of oil formed by the crossing and recrossing into ten thousand infiltrated cells of tough elastic white fibers throughout its whole extent. The upper part, known as the case, may be regarded as the great Heidelberg ton of the sperm whale. And as that famous great tierce is mystically carved in front, so the whale's vast pleated forehead forms innumerable strange devices for the emblematical adornment of his wondrous ton. Moreover, as that of Heidelberg was always replenished with the most excellent of wines from the Rhenish valleys, so the ton of the whale contains by far the most precious of all his oily vintages, namely the highly prized spermaceti, in its absolutely pure, limpid, and odoriferous state nor is this precious substance found unalloyed in any other part of the creature. Though in life it remains perfectly fluid, yet upon exposure to the air after death, it soon begins to concrete, sending forth beautiful crystalline shoots, as when the first thin, delicate ice is just forming in water. A large whale's case generally yields about five hundred gallons of sperm, though, from unavoidable circumstances, considerable of it is spilled, leaks and dribbles away, or is otherwise irrevocably lost in the ticklish business of securing what you can. I know not with what fine and costly material the Heidelberg ton was coated within, but in superlative richness that coating could not possibly have compared with the silken pearl-colored membrane, like the lining of a fine pelisse, forming the inner surface of the sperm whale's case. It will have been seen that the Heidelberg ton of the sperm whale embraces the entire length of the entire top of the head, and since, as has been elsewhere set forth, the head embraces one-third of the whole length of the creature, then setting that length down at eighty feet for a good-sized whale, you have more than twenty-six feet for the depth of the ton, when it is lengthwise hoisted up and down against the ship's side. As in decapitating the whale, the operator's instrument is brought close to the spot where an entrance is subsequently forced into the spermaceti magazine. He has, therefore, to be uncommonly heedful, lest a careless, untimely stroke should invade the sanctuary, 
and wastingly let out its invaluable contents. It is this decapitated end of the head also which is at last elevated out of the water, and retained in that position by the enormous cutting tackles, whose hempen combinations on one side make quite a wilderness of ropes in that quarter. Thus much being said, attend now, I pray you, to that marvellous and, in this particular instance, almost fatal operation, whereby the sperm whale's great Heidelberg ton is tapped. End of chapters 74 to 77